I'm Keith Trenka, currently I'm on sabbatical, and I like to do my coffee in AeroPress, so even though I'm traveling right now, I've got my AeroPress, i got my hand grinder, and uh, it's just a wonderful way to do it. Welcome back to the MLOps Community Podcast, everyone. I am your host, Dimitri Os, and today it's just me. It's a very special episode. I'm talking with Keith Trinka. This man has been in the game for about 11 years. He is the definition of what I would call a leader. I would love to have him as my boss at my next job. He thinks through things so thoroughly, and he is able to lead through example. It's incredible what we were able to talk about, whether that was leading data teams or machine learning teams, becoming a better software engineer himself. I mean, you name it. We talked about a whole migration from a monolith to microservices, and they had zero, absolutely zero downtime during that whole process. And it was especially important because he was working in the healthcare sector. So... Let me give you a bit of background about Keith before we jump into this full conversation. Most recently, he was the director of data science at 98.6, where he made telemedicine visits easier for doctors using natural language processing, machine learning, back-end engineering, a little bit of AWS, and some front-end engineering sprinkled on top there. So basically, they made a killer application with technology for doctors to use. And it had a little bit of machine learning in there, and that's where Keith fit into the mix. Prior to that, though, Keith improved the language models used in mobile phone keyboards at Swipe and Nuance. And before that, he did a PhD thesis in language modeling for assistive technology. And currently, the man is living the dream. He is on sabbatical somewhere in Spain, I think one of the islands that they have. I am always jealous whenever I talk to him. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been getting the opportunity to chat with him a bunch, and it's always sunny where he is, and it's cold and rainy where I am. So let's jump into this conversation we had with Keith. So go for it. How did you get into machine learning? Well, for me, it really started in in undergrad. I took an artificial intelligence class at the College of New Jersey, and it was a really interesting class. And then I did a uh, a research project with the professor later on. And then through various twists and turns, I went to grad school. I went for a PhD at, at the University of Delaware. And, you know, then I got more and more excited I was I was more on the language modeling side for a while, and that that was uh, my thesis work was in language modeling for assistive technology. I stayed in language modeling for a while, and then being in industry, I started to see that language modeling was a bit of a narrow scope, and I, I wanted to expand more generally into other kinds of natural language processing and machine learning. So I slowly made that transition after my first role at Swipe and Nuance. Nice. So then you started working, you went to Swipe and you went to Nuance. And then how did you start to apply what you had learned? Like from school or from those places? I would say both. That's actually a good call. And I was thinking about school in the beginning, but I imagine you're learning a ton on the job. It's, you know, you're really learning all different angles of things. And I think I've been fortunate enough to have a wide range of experiences. So, so one of the things that's, that's maybe, it's not uncommon, but it's not totally common, which is having teaching experience from my time in grad school. And I learned a lot from that. And then that helps me when I'm mentoring people, or if I'm doing a lecture in a company or any kind of presentation there. Um, and then in industry, you find probably in your first week that it wasn't like school taught you, uh, Where's all the clean data? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh well, uh, yeah, definitely. Where's all the clean data? Even on the software engineering side, right? My undergrad was was more focused on software engineering, and you know, you think, oh, I just write code, but but over the years in industry, I think for me, I started to feel more and more that code was, in a lot of ways, communicating with other developers, and. And so, what do you mean by that? Well, you know how you name your variables, how you name your functions, how you structure your code, 
is you wow. have to get your headspace into their head and you have to get their headspace into your head. And so writing code effectively, there's a lot to it, of course, but a lot of it is communication when it comes down to it. And a lot of the mistakes that happen are miscommunication. Of course, uh, school doesn't teach you that. School teaches you, you write the code and you're big O and all this and, and such. Uh, Execute, hello world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you have to deploy the stuff and, and get it out for users. Yeah. And then you have to monitor it and make sure it doesn't break. So, yeah, I learned a ton from there. Over my career, I would say in each different role, there were even probably some internships earlier on where I think over time, what I saw was that it usually wasn't the machine learning part that led to a project failing. Usually it was trying to do something that didn't make sense, that the users didn't need or the business didn't need, sometimes being too excited about technology or not excited enough about understanding the needs of who you're building for. Um, that That's one really common failure mode. Another uh, really common failure mode is not necessarily the machine learning part, but everything around it, right? Like how do you get something out to a server? How do you, when it goes wrong, how do you revert it? How do you know when to revert it? How do you know quickly? You know, how do you make sure you're not woken up 20 times in the middle of the night from alarms at least? <laughs> and all those things end up being a, a really big factor in actually making a difference for your users or actually making a difference for the business. And so I've had the opportunity of having a few different experiences and being able to see some of those failure modes over time is what got me into more starting to see the the bigger picture and is starting to uh, focus more on understanding what our users really need and, and put extra effort into mm. that. Focus more on how we are going to deploy things in a way that's not going to break our backs. How we're going to make sure that things are uh, reliable and safe. That we don't have too many surprises. You can't eliminate all surprises, but you can you can tone them down a little bit, right? But yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, I started off more on that ML side then. Once I realized what it took to make a difference for the users, I, I kind of expanded into a lot of the other areas. You mentioned something fascinating, which going back to the code being a way that developers are able to talk with each other and you have to really take time to think through how you're naming variables and the comments that you're leaving and all of that good stuff. Do you feel like some of the pain sometimes when working data scientists try and work together is because they don't have that as much? And especially I think about when you're playing with a Jupyter Notebook, sometimes it can be very clear and it's just like run, execute. If somebody has set up that notebook knowing that others are going to use it, but for the most part, I feel like that's not really how things, especially in exploration mode, are set up. And so... I've heard stories about a data scientist taking six weeks when another colleague leaves the company and they're just trying to like piece together what the hell was going on. And so I think back to your phrase of, hey, this is how we're talking to each other. When you look at it like that and you look at how just inherently data scientists work and explore, do you feel like that is a good assumption? Yeah, you know, I think there's two different things going on there, right? I think there are some unique challenges in uh, trying to explain what you mean by a piece of code to another person. Some unique challenges when you're dealing with data science. And also, there are challenges with dealing with exploration. And I think those challenges do apply even in the software engineering world as well. And so I think over time, we'll start to see those parallels more. But um, to go back to some of the challenges in data science, I think machine learning is a complex field. And the way I view it is that there's a lot to know. There's a lot to learn. There's so much terminology. It's so, you know, math driven and sort of that old school math, which has a lot of terminology. And people really have to adapt to that to learn and to, to develop something and forget that not everyone has that background. Yeah. Right. And so I think data science pushes people in some ways pretty hard on some of the terminology. And then uh, an individual data scientist might forget that not everyone has the same background. I think it's natural to assume that other people think the way you do or have the background you do, because that's the easiest way to yeah. 
to think about. That's why I say it's kind of a miscommunication. It's just it's just a mistake. It's not, you know, something worse going on usually. Uh, it's just they worked really hard to learn all this terminology and they assume everyone else had too. Um, so yeah. I, th- I think there is some stuff unique there. Um, and on the exploration side of things, I think there it's it's so much of a struggle to make something work at all or to make something <laughs> that might work or has the potential of being useful at all that that's got to be your top priority. Um, but what I like to do, actually one thing that I will, I'll take a quick detour and say, um, I think one really eye-opening experience that probably has happened to, you've probably gone through this too, is you look at a piece of code, you say, oh, this is awful. Who wrote this? And then you look at it, it's like, oh, I wrote this. Um, I know where you're going. Yep. It's just like such a formative experience when, when I had some moments like that and I said, oh, okay. You know, it's not just about for other people. It's also for myself down the road. Um, and that also gives you a hint of ways you can learn that is you can look at some of your old code and say, how can I improve this? How can I make this yeah. last the, the test of time? But, uh, in exploration mode, I think if you hit a wall in terms of your research and you're, you're kind of stumped on ideas, go take 10 minutes, clean up your code, break something from a giant Jupyter notebook into cells that are well explained, well commented, or chip away at it over time. Um, I also really recommend to people like when parts of your notebook become stable, start moving them over into Python files. So you're getting ready for them to become long lasting code, that sort of thing, import them into multiple notebooks, that sort of thing. So I I think it's something you can chip away at. Um, you have to develop the habit. It's just kind of hard though. Exploration is just one of those things where you, you're left with 90% code that, you know, is throwaway and then. If you're lucky, ten percent of the code survives. Yeah, yeah. So, so funny. And I want to put a pin in that because I want to come back to some of those best practices that you found when you do find something that you want to run with. And you mentioned, yeah, starting to find that stable uh, notebook piece or these pieces that you then want to keep and make sure you start putting them in into Python code or doing. St- other things with it. But before we jump into that, I am fascinated with the idea that you were talking about where you started to recognize the bigger picture. Uh And it reminded me of, I'm reading this book right now, Build by Uh Tony Fidel, the dude who uh, created the Nest uh, thermostat. Uh And it's a great book. And he talks about how even if you're an individual contributor, What he says is you still have to look up sometimes Uh and you have to recognize, look up and look around Uh basically. And it's talking about how you may think that everyone is, knows what's going on and they're pointing you in the right direction. And then you just have to go and execute on that direction that they're pointing you in. But it is very beneficial if you look up and you look around by talking to people, by checking with other teams by seeing what is actually going on, that you can better understand the product that you're creating. And so it sounds like you you kind of got that over time. You were, uh, what is it, baptized by fire, <laughs> we could say. Yeah, and yeah, a bit. So maybe we can go down that road for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think even, even when I was, you know, I swipe a nuance, I was, uh, say, a couple years in, I really like to have the context behind things. I I didn't necessarily know why. I just knew that I did a better job with it. But now the the way that I usually explain it is that, say, a a mission statement or or a JIRA ticket or or some some way of describing the work or requirements, it's going to tell you three of the things that you need to do um, in in your project in in the next month or so. Uh, it's not going to tell you the hundred small decisions that have impact on the user that will come up in the nature of that development. And so having that context gives you a way to fill in those blanks in a way that's aligned with your users, that's aligned with the business, that's aligned with the other business units. Fascinating. And, and means that at the end of the day, you have a really coherent product that's well aligned uh, with the needs. And so that's, that's how I think about it now is that having that context 
allows you to make more effective decisions in development. What does that mean? Like the context and you just talk to others, you ask for some kind of report as to why we're putting this into um, play. What does that actually look like? Yeah. So uh, I think the simplest way that I like to put it is to just try to understand your users, you know, try to try to empathize with them, understand what their frustrations are. Um, so my last role was, was in um, healthcare and I, I hadn't worked in healthcare before. I didn't really understand how doctors think and, and what their needs are, but now I have a much better sense of that. And so, you know, if I'm going into a project in healthcare now, I know that doctors are sensitive to things like liability or, uh, you know, sensitive to safety for instance, in a lot of ways. And so if a project's been handed to me or, you know, someone has an idea and we're talking about it, but no one's talked about like liability or safety, I'm going to step back and think, oh, I know that this is something that doctors really care about. Are there any implications here? Sometimes I can answer that question. And sometimes it just means that I say, okay, well, what about such and such? And start to work with other people to fill in those blanks. So it's not necessarily that you can fill all of the blanks in yourself, but at least knowing, you know, when to double check, what, you know, what you're trying to build as much as possible. And another way to look at it is that, you know, if you're working with a PM or, or someone in UX, it's everybody's got each other's backs. They're not going to get a hundred percent of the requirements perfect. You know, if they do a phenomenal job, maybe they'll get 70% of the requirements, right? And you can help out by asking some of these questions and getting it to 75%, 80%. And then what you can do to go further is you can build demos. You can demonstrate it to your potential users. Uh, you can listen to their feedback. You can ask why questions, you know, try not to lead them such. And you can start to understand how it may or may not work for them. You glossed over something there that I want to double click on, which is around how you had no experience in healthcare and then you started working in healthcare and you recognize that doctors had certain passions or they cared deeply yes. about certain things. How did you even get to know that? Was that by listening to calls with different doctors or did you go out and talk with doctors or did you just, was that common knowledge around the office? Uh, oh, that's a great question. So I joined that company when we were fairly small. So we were like 15 to 20 people. Then we grew over the years. Um, and we had uh, one full-time doctor on staff. Uh, we didn't actually have a, a working product yet. And and so I really needed like chat logs between patients and doctors. And so one of the things that we did is we created artificial scenarios. And I, I read about patient acting. And I learned as much as I could about that. And <laughs> You would be the doctor and I would be the patient and run through oh, a scenario. So you have a career in acting. Is that <laughs> what's going on? I get it. Now it all right. makes sense. Is that what you're doing uh, in Spain? No, Are you no, going no. For... I mean, that, that sounds amazing, oh. but no, no, no. No, I mean, it, you know, we were just trying to solve the problem of how do we get some data? And I think that we would go through it and then, you know, maybe afterwards I would say, oh, well, why did you, you know, read through 10 of our chats and I would say, oh, well, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? And then um, that doctor would explain it. And I would say, oh, okay, that's what you're doing. I'm like, well, but you, don't you pretty much know that this is a common cold? He's like, yeah, but I have to make sure it's not this, or I have to make sure it's not this, because even though it's unlikely, it could be fatal, right? And so it's worth that extra check to check for these things. And so I talked to him about those kinds of things. Uh, and then sometimes we would uh, make tests harder, you know, there was one where we tried to do it in a situation where we was distracted and I, we learned a lot from that. Don't, don't try to distract doctors while they're practicing. But uh, over time, it's, re you know, we made, uh, I made friends with not just him, but a lot of the other doctors and talked to them, listened to their feedback when, when things didn't go well, when they didn't. Uh, like any of the features uh, or like some of the features that we built, I would really try to understand why and try to understand what it was about that and, and just ask lots and lots of questions and get to know them. And, you know, let build that relationship as well. And they'll just volunteer information to you is another way to go about it. Mm -hmm. So 
there, there are a lot of things there of just connecting to people and learning from them. That was a very fortunate situation where the doctors were a part of the company, and so I could do that. That's not always the situation in building healthcare technology, and so it can be much tougher to get user feedback. You might have to rely on you know, a dedicated team to do that and, and read their reports, but that's that's another way to do it. You can also just read through data. It's, an, it's another way to um, to go about it or, or sort of analyze data as much as you can to get multiple different perspectives on the same thing. Yeah, that's brilliant. The idea that you as a engineer or data scientist would go out there and try and figure out what your users, the doctors, wanted and you're not at all like your role didn't say product manager and no, your title no. if i'm not mistaken and so yeah. it's just something that you're doing because you you saw over time that projects were failing because you didn't have an understanding of what you're building yeah i think at that company it happened so early on that there were some cases where projects didn't go well um because they were they were maybe not well aligned with the needs of our users or, or our business, but um, I don't think it was soon enough that we had a lot of clear signal on many features. Um, so it's not necessarily that you know things were disastrous and, and I sort of like intervened to do all this stuff. Um, I will say it's also one of those things that's easy to do in a small company. If you're all working in the same room, you get to know each other, you have lunch together, you chat. Um, you build relationships and you start to learn about, you know, okay, so each different person has a role to play in the company and how is that role is valuable to the mission of the company uh, and sort of how, what their concerns are, you know, when you're, when you're talking to them, what do they, what do they worry about? Right. Why is it that they worry about certain things? Uh, and, and so there's, there's just, I feel like there's so much to, to learn there from, frankly, just making friends around the office and learning what they do and why and what their concerns are. There was uh, one thing you said, though, that was about sort of asking doctors what they want. Well, uh, I would say, you know, you know, I had talked about like the, the mom test, that book a while back. And, yep. and uh, it's it's a little bit, you can ask that. It's a little bit risky, though, to ask people for the solution that they want. A lot of times um, people will gravitate towards what they're familiar with. Um, and then... Mm -hmm it becomes very hard to innovate if you're rebuilding the same thing uh, over and over again. Now, there are times yeah. and places where that's the right thing to do, and there's times and places where that's not the right thing to do. So it's it's always good as much as possible to to dive deep and to try to understand the motivation behind it, You know, which is why I, I brought up safety as an underlying thing. That's not telling you a solution. It's telling you something that they're very concerned about, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that, then you can start to think through what's your next set of questions for for a doctor or what solutions might be just off the table uh, because they have some some negative safety implications. How do you balance between the drive to try and create something new or explore and cutting your losses and saying this new project is never going to see the light of day. It's just not working out. Uh, that. That's such a hard question. Um, I can tell you what I've done. I, I don't know that I have some sort of deep wisdom there. Um, <laughs> I would say because at, it's like you say, you're kind of cutting your losses on a project. The project, maybe you started off, you're optimistic, and you know, three to six months in, you don't have any results. You've tried out a few different things. Nothing's, nothing's working. And you're asking yourself, well, do we just not have the right people on the team for it? Is it a problem where we're missing skills? Is it a problem where um, we don't really have a clear idea of what we're building? You know, sometimes that's that's it. Um, is it a problem where the, the tech just isn't there yet, right? So, like, the the hotness right now is, is GPT, right? And it's not there yet to practice safe medicine, <laughs> right? <laughs> like... You can't, but you know, so there's, there's, and you just don't know if you've, you've put time into it. You just don't know why it didn't work out. You don't know if something else had been different, could it have worked out? And so the best I can really say is that 
before you get too far along, like maybe once you're a couple of days or a week in, you should put a real effort into saying, what's, what's the best possible outcome of this project? What are some other realistic outcomes of this project? Try to do some kind of, um, you know, what percentage benefit to our users would this have? Try to put it in terms of business metrics as much as possible and say to yourself, how much uh, time is, is worthwhile to put towards that? Um, because if it's something that's a very small benefit, you might be able to say, hey, you know, if, if we spend more than two months of company time on it, even in the best case scenario, the company loses money, uh -huh. right? You can do some things like that. Usually, though, it's very hard because the, the best case scenario is, is very high and the worst case scenario is very negative. And so at some point you make a call and uh, there are a lot of projects where I look back and I say, oh, if we had put another six months into it, would it have worked? Or if we had trained up our skills in a certain area, would it have worked? Or if, if we had pursued it in a different way, would it have worked? And I just don't know. Um, yeah. I'm left wondering a lot of times. I think one thing I will add to that though, is that there's sort of the, the leadership aspect of it that I think you're getting out of like, okay, when, to, when to cancel a project, I guess is, is sort of the pithy way of putting it. Um, but <laughs> you know, you really want to have people involved in that. You don't want to be a leader that's coming down and saying like, look, we're six months in and it's canceled today. You don't want to do that, right? Yeah. Like you want to uh, work with the people as much as possible to say, Hey, like it's been six months. Here's as much as possible. Here's the dollars that our company has spent investigating this. Um, here's, mm -hmm. um, the best of our knowledge, uh, potential benefit and talk with people and say, you know, Hey, like it's, should we set this aside for now? And maybe we'll come back to it in a couple of years if we have a good idea. But, um, there's the how to it like sort of how to to do that uh well so that people aren't demotivated as a result afterwards oh that's so good so now getting back into this nitty-gritty when you're getting ready to go to production and you're coming from your jupiter notebook mm -hmm. you explored and let's say that this is the successful time it is one of mm -hmm. those joyous moments that something worked and you want to now start making it more of a process what are those best takeaways that you've found for actually solidifying that process? So, so a good first part, and this can happen um, entirely by the person that, that wrote the notebook, is to simplify. Like that, that should be step one, simplify. Probably there's a bunch of like subtle features in your Jupyter notebook that add, you know, double the size of your code and add 1% quality or something like that. There's probably a lot of exploration like that. Rip it all out as much as you can, um, and try to try to simplify because uh, all of the later steps are kind of multiplying on that size of that code and the complexity of that code. Um, so that's that's a big first step. Um, next up after that, I would say for us, it really depended where we are at in our journey. So early on, uh, we didn't have a lot of the DevOps, MLOps skill set, we, we weren't very comfortable with even Docker, right? And, you know, we, we could write services in Flask and Python and such, but, uh, we weren't really comfortable with a whole lot of those parts. And so, uh, for us, what it would turn into is start to convert, uh, your Jupyter notebooks into a training and training and serving code and put them into a monolith. We had, uh, what was it? I think Jenkins or, or something like that to, to do model rebuilds. And we had some processes around model versioning. And so, uh, by doing kind of a mono repo setup, when we we're going to production, we didn't have to reassess things like, how do you, how do you version models? How do you train models? How do you, uh, deploy models? How do you host models? How do you do, you know, how do you do auto scaling? All these things, it was all sort of figured out for us. <laughs> um, so that's that's sort of how that was. Over time, we switched to something more like microservices where, you know, we might have one service for a model, so then it would be like one repo with training and serving in it. Um, and we didn't have so many models that we had a, 
a well-defined template, but we were kind of getting there. And so a lot of times we would do that. It would usually involve partnership between a research scientist and a software engineer, maybe that had some AWS experience to sort of say, hey, you know, you want to do this thing. Here's, here's some, some things that you got to think about. Or, hey, you've got some unique situation with a particular model. Here's what we got to do. I would say I'm also leaving out one step in there, which was for us, there was there were multiple stages of experimentation. So you have a Jupyter notebook stage of experimentation. You have some idea that something has potential for your users. And the next stage after that isn't a full release for everyone, right? There, there are a lot of projects that proceed that way. What I had seen was that it would typically take months and months to, to jump from say Jupyter Notebook to full prod release. And then there would just be a lot of like really low hanging fruit kind of feedback, like, oh, it doesn't do this right. It doesn't do this right that we could have known and we should have known. Yeah. And so what we moved to, um, was doing a limited launch. So we had an internal beta test group and we would develop for that test group. Now, if you're doing an internal beta test, you do still have some of the same software engineering standards, you know, around say security and privacy. Um, but if it goes down for a few hours, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's just a beta test. Right. And so you're, you're able to accelerate the development of that and then launch it with a limited group and then from there, a lot of the, the things that help are developing a culture where your users and your developers are talking to each other in a productive way. I mean, not in like a sending 10 page manifestos way, but in like a, you're just in a Slack channel talking like normal people way. Um, and then what you can do is you iterate on that little by little, week by week until, until you've taken care of a lot of the low hanging fruit. And then you can have a, a go, no go moment launch of production um so so that's what we did that was extremely effective um there were times where something worked in a notebook and we couldn't find a way to build a feature that was valuable for our users and then we said you know oh wow uh we're, we're gonna set this back on the shelf for a while maybe we'll come back to it in some number of years or maybe we just think that this isn't a valid approach but then there were other times where it was highly successful and then those users, those beta testers become your advocate and they talk to their peers and say, Hey, we really want this feature. And so they're kind of pulling your feature into the product instead of you pushing against some kind of roadmap. Oh, wow. Um, so it, it, there's I so much, so many layers to the cultural aspect to it, um, to get things working smoothly where, you know, it's not so heavy on process, but it's more about like, Hey, you're trying to do good for, good for your users and how can you make that smooth? So how did your team evolve? I know that we had a great conversation a week or two ago about how you, and you said something that has stuck with me, which is you weren't able to properly hire like a senior nice. engineer until you felt like you were a good engineer or at least a decent engineer. I think <laughs> is the, the level. And it. so... Because you're very humble. I'm sure you're an incredible engineer. Oh, I'm not thanks. trying I to it. cut you down. It's it's more because I think you didn't you didn't want to like talk yourself up. Uh, but that to me was fascinating because it's like was that because you couldn't attract the right talent? Was it because you weren't able to properly judge who was good and who was right. bad? How? Uh, uh, great question. Explain that to me. Either. So so early on. So this was at ninety eight point six and. Early on, I, I think when I joined, I was like, oh, you know, I'm here to do the machine learning stuff. Um, and I knew that involved creating data sets as well. I think some people kind of separate those two, but I knew, you know, all right, I'm going to create data sets too, do annotation, all that sort of stuff. Maybe a little bit of backend engineering. I didn't go into it thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to get into um, how we design databases or, or into the AWS side of things or into security side of things or any of these things. Uh, or, or front end or any of this. But over time, I started to see that as the company was scaling, our lead time was slowing down. So our time from a research prototype success to getting it into production being used actively, that time was taking longer. Um, and just 
the nature of scaling a company, and that's sort of how it goes. Uh, at least that's how it went, I should say. I started to look at the bottlenecks. Some of it was just coming down to like cross org stuff. I started to see, okay, well, we really need to understand Docker, say, or we need to understand Flask better, or we need to understand on call better, or, or all these different concepts. And so over time, I started to realize, okay, well, we really need expertise in this area. Um, we tried some things of, of pulling in people from other teams, but they had their own priorities. And so that was always kind of a challenge. Uh, we tried hiring, I would say this was early on at the company. And now that I have a lot more experience, I have a, a very different perspective on hiring. But at the time I thought it was just like, you write a job description, send it to HR, and then they'll send you a bunch of great candidates and you're done. It, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, later on, I came to see that it really helps to be personally involved in hiring and to uh, iterate on your job description as much as possible. Get out there talking to candidates. If if you're not getting enough candidates through, escalate with your you know with your recruiting team or, or do some sourcing yourself or outsource sourcing. There's so many options you have, but you got to solve that problem. Um, at the time, I I wasn't in that mindset yet, and so you know we were trying to hire someone more senior because we knew we were having we were spending all this time on engineering problems, kind of almost standard engineering problems with a slight ML twist. I think one, one point for me that, that was a real turning point was we were doing a project, uh, a proof of concept project with SageMaker, I think it was. I think that's, that's when it was. And I had someone on my team that had maybe a couple of years experience and it was a real struggle. There's so many different concepts and especially if you're dealing with keeping your data really private you have really strict IAM uh, requirements, um, internal company requirements for for how locked down your IAM is. That can be a real struggle, uh, especially for someone that's you know say a few years out of school, right? And so I said, look, we're not we're not making progress on the hiring thing. Maybe at least I can look into this a little bit and try to understand at least basic. Maybe I can be like the person that they talk to, even if I don't have all the answers. Maybe I can help them talk through them. That's sort of where I started. And then over time, I started to get more and more into that. Um, that was sort of how I learned more of the nitty gritty of AWS. And then I started to see, oh, actually, like putting a little bit of effort that, oh, I can actually like help be that person that people elsewhere in the company talk to about different concepts. Because it turns out a lot of people struggle with IAM. A lot of people struggle with all things AWS. Um, it's generally not taught in school. Um, and so to just having someone to talk to helps out a lot. And so that was, that was a big part of it. Another big part of it was that I was friends with, with someone that was, that was more connected in the, the DevOps world. Um, and so I had just been, was like, oh, what's this state of DevOps report thing? Uh, you know, they would share that, um, you know, every year. I started reaching, I was like, oh, actually there's some interesting stuff there. It's really, you know, about how do we have high productivity teams and at the time I was also reading all these management books on like, you know, productivity. And so, um, <laughs> you know, through a lot of twists and turns, I just kind of, kind of stumbled into some of it, um, both on the technical side and then more on the, the cultural side as well. Yeah. I mean, you threw it out there, so I can't help but ask, but did you find any high productivity team tips that you liked? And is there a caveat? when dealing with machine learning? Uh, to keep things really simple, I would say do retrospectives periodically. And what I mean by a retrospective is, you know, get get as many people together as, as you can that were involved in a project um, where you can have a conversation, where you can have a candid conversation and say, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what could we do better? You know, what, what were the areas where we slowed down the most or where we struggled or what? Um, and really build that habit of reflecting on how you can improve and leaning on others um, and working together to uncover that. It's a very simple sort of thing. Um, related to that, I would say a couple of different approaches look at software development as sort of a factory. I, you know, I think that doesn't feel good to call it that, but uh, and but. 
the gist is to to try to look at it as a unit that's producing software and try to look for the bottlenecks. Uh, you know, how do you, for one, how do you, uh, how do you measure sort of your input and output metrics, um, or how do you assess whether it's working well? And then, you know, where it is working well or not working well, how do you pinpoint where your limiting factors are? And then intervene on where your limiting factors are. So there were times later on where hiring was our limiting factor. So then I spent my time on hiring. There were times where <laughs> AWS was our limiting factor. So I spent time on AWS and in those moments, you have a lot of different options as a leader. You can spend time there personally. You can, you know, uh, contract someone. You could bring in some expertise. There, there are a lot of ways to address that bottleneck. But the first step is you have to acknowledge uh, what your limiting factors are. So let's go into the idea of from what I found fascinating. Last, uh, again, one of the times that we talked to you was... I was trying to ask you about data scientists and if you taught them to code or you taught them coding best practices and something that you had mentioned was it's very difficult to force something like that onto anybody. It doesn't have to be data scientists, although they are notoriously, they're, they're known for their coding practices. And I think a lot of it, they've gotten a bad rap. Uh, I'm not one of those people that likes to talk a lot of shit on data scientists coding practices or say that they're lazy and they just don't want to. I know there are a lot of people out there that have been scarred by the <laughs> data scientist who refuses to even learn Git, <laughs> but that's not me. I luckily have not had those experiences. You, however, leading this team, you had people that you knew it would be very beneficial for them to learn coding best practices, but you couldn't just give them that, or you couldn't just mandate that from above, because that is a whole different way of your working style, I think. So how did you inspire people to learn things as opposed to dictate from above? I will say there are times when you you have to have a mandate, if you're having a lot of outages, or if you have um, privacy breaches or something like that, there are times when you have to. But that said, I think some of it goes back to my experience in teaching, actually, where I found that when you had a student that was was motivated and excited about the material, like you were just a facilitator, you know, you were just, you're like, oh, I'll read this article, read this article, and they would just sort of soak it all up. Um, and so you're, you're there to support them. Um, you'd also have some students that you know, we're just completely unmotivated. It was a class requirement and they didn't want to be there. And there were times where it felt like there was nothing you could do to, to teach, you know, a person that was unmotivated. And, you know, the reality is probably a lot more nuanced than that. But I think that I had similar experiences in, in managing a team where you're going to get the best results when someone's ready to learn something, when someone is both motivated and ready for it. And if you push really hard, um, that people just naturally resist being pushed. It's, it's just a natural kind of instinctual thing. Um, you know, sometimes people are very subtle about how to, how to push, but, and sometimes that can work. But, you know, I think people learn to some extent at their own pace and you want to accelerate that pace and you kind of work with it, right? The way to do that with someone that, you know, maybe uh, doesn't have a history of clean code or, or something like that is is to say like, look, all right, well, you got to get, get your thing shipped and, you know, maybe there's some bug and you have a retrospective and it turns out like, oh, the bug was because of some misunderstanding and you, you ask why a lot and you find out, oh, it's because this part of code was really unclear. You say, okay, well, well, how can we next time around, how can we make our code more clear or something like that? Or like, Hey, you know, I'm happy to review some code for you. Um, and I'll, I'll go a step further and I'll say code review is another really uh, culturally subtle type thing. I've seen cultures of code review that can be very aggressive and people are really kind of um, taking shots at each other almost. And in that kind of a culture, people start to become defensive and then they slow down and will never submit something for review until it's perfect. Yeah. 
And that's, you want a culture where people are looking out for each other and where code review has a mixture of, you know, protecting your users and also kind of leveling each other up and getting the tone of that right is, is kind of tricky. Everyone's different on a case by case basis, but if you build a team where everyone's trying to level each other up and you have a mixture of skills over time, it all just kind of works out. So the hard work goes into how do you build a culture where you've got people with deep expertise in software engineering and people with deep expertise in machine learning and deep expertise in say AWS, they're all talking to each other and leveling each other up. If you can develop that culture, then you'll get there. Maybe you won't get there in one month, but you'll get there. And so, you know, I think you just got to work with the people that you have and build a culture where you're going to get there. Maybe not on a schedule, but you're going to get there. And when you're seeing a little bit more aggressivity, is that a word? I don't know, but aggressiveness than you would like in code reviews or uh, GitHub. Are you pulling people aside in their in your one on ones with them and saying like, "Hey, what's going on here? Is everything all right?" Yeah, you know, I, I would say sometimes. Yeah, if I if I've seen that, then then sometimes I'll do that. Or, you know, if it if it's one person, then yeah. If it's multiple people, then that's a sign that something else is wrong, right? You you have to decide whether is this a systematic problem or a one person problem, because if it's a one person problem, it's kind of, it's probably wrong to make a policy about it probably just talk to that person. Uh, if it's a systematic problem, you, you probably have something else going on. Maybe policy will help. Maybe coaching, you know, large group coaching will help all different kinds of things. Um, one thing you can do is lead by example as much if you have time. Uh, that's, that's the hard yeah. thing, but uh, that's, that's how I like to do it is to, to go do some code reviews where I try to level people up. Uh, you know, maybe I can, you know, do one a week or something. Um, Another thing is, is even a retrospective doesn't have to be formal, but I like that way of thinking. Um, so someone could say, oh, you know, this code review, it just, it's been I'm struggling, you know, it's been, it's been a couple of weeks or something. And you start to say, well, you know, what's going on, you know, and you look at it and it's like, you know, a 5,000 line change and you're like, well, <laughs> I mean, who's got time to read 5,000 lines of code in detail? And you start to say, okay, well, this is the situation. This is the reality. We have this 5,000 line change right now. And how can we make the, be the best of that? But the PR process on GitHub is not ideal for that kind of review. And so that's an example where we learned from that. And we said, okay, how can we, how can we take that mindset of we're all trying to, to watch each other's backs and trying to get things done for our users. And we're all trying to learn and grow. And we have this situation with a 5,000 line PR. Well, you know, we say, okay, let's get in a room and talk about, you know, the overall principles. Let's do maybe even a walkthrough, right? Like that, maybe that'll take an hour. Maybe that'll take two hours. It's going to be a lot faster than someone just like sitting in a room trying to figure out 5,000 lines of code, right? And then maybe after that, they can review, right? In more depth. But, you know, you, you want to take a step back and kind of reflect on things because, our, our standard processes aren't always going to work. I, I want to ask you about this uh, migration that you did and how you, it, what was it? It was zero downtime and it was yeah. migrating from, yeah, give us that story. Yeah, so so we, for a while we had um, kind of a monolith for our machine learning services because uh, we didn't understand much about the deployment and we just kind of, put more stuff in there, um, with a classic increasing the RAM every, every time we added a new model kind of thing. Um, uh, it was on, um, Aptable, which, um, I guess I'm dating myself now, but it's kind of like Heroku. It's like the old Heroku, but for healthcare, uh, where it's, it was pretty simple, but it gives you HIPAA compliance and a lot of nice things. Um, and the company more and more was, was just going with like pure AWS. And we were having some trouble with Apple too. So sometimes deployments would fail for kind of mysterious reasons. The Docker registry we were using for it would also sometimes fail in mysterious region ways. Sometimes we had one shoe where it failed in a way that like corrupted the one 
part of the thing, so we couldn't update anything off of a certain base Python image on that one. It took us forever to debug, but uh, so we had a bunch of issues that were we were frustrated about. So we were motivated. Um, so we said, okay, well, we got to move this over to AWS. The two options that we knew about were ECS and uh, and Lambda, and the the team did a comparison between the two, did load testing, they found that Lambda was better suited for our needs. Um, and then for starting to go towards deployment, the I said like, look, we're we're gonna have to switch over, and I know that deployments have some you know some percentage of deployments fail, and just from unanticipated things. And it's it's not okay for us to say, okay, well, there's a percentage chance that we're going to take this stuff down for our doctors and patients. And we might not know what to do about it. You know, that's, that's totally unacceptable. Uh, so I said, okay, well, it has to be, the deployment has to happen with zero downtime. Maybe one or two failed requests is okay, but not, you know, 10 minutes or something. Um, and if it goes wrong, you have to be able to, you know, revert quickly, say within a minute. Um, and that's particularly challenging because we were going from Aftable to AWS uh, and we needed to keep the DNS the same. Dang. Right? So you could switch the DNS from pointing to one, from one server to the other, but updating DNS records isn't fast enough. And so uh, I don't actually remember all of the nitty gritty details, I think there was, I think what we ended up doing is switching the DNS to a layer of indirection that we could update quickly. Um, and then we were able to switch that um, essentially pointer um, much more quickly. So we could do an instantaneous switch over or switch back. Uh, I think the thing that for me that was, I was really proud of is that uh, the team tested that they could do a deploy and a revert with zero downtime, like in a lower environment. So the team actually tested that. And um, I said to the team, depending on your test, like I was actually going on vacation when this was happening. So depending on your test, like- Like a good bot. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you know, right at, right at a critical moment. I said like, look, if you feel comfortable with it, like you can do this deploy to prod. I trust you guys. You know, I think you've done your homework here. Make sure, don't do a Friday night, of course. Do it kind of midday or something. Some low volume time that uh, where you're going to be around to watch it. Um, yeah. And and they were able to do that, you know, zero downtime migration from one cloud to another. While I was on vacation, everything went smoothly. Nothing went wrong. And wasn't there something about choosing between Lambda and EKS that later you realized, oh, was, oh Lambda might not have been the best choice. Yeah, yeah. So for us, it was Lambda and ECS. Um, we didn't have actually uh, Kubernetes experience, I don't think, in, in the org. But um, so we, we did a bake off between the two, did some load testing. Um, and actually, surprisingly, even for the machine learning uh, workload uh, without any provision of concurrency, in our load test, we found that, that Lambda had um, lower latency which shocked me that, you know, just was, was surprising. Um, some of that probably has to do with the way that ECS, um, auto scaling was set up and, and such versus Lambda. When we had actually migrated to Lambda, what we found was that we would periodically have just, you know, cold start latency spikes on Lambda. You know, we had set up provision concurrency to minimize that, but periodically it would still happen. Maybe you get some unusual traffic for, for a minute or two. And I think. On reflecting on that, because um, later I tried out the load testing tool used called Locust, and I think what had happened is that we probably used a um, load testing profile, and you know, we were doing sort of scaling load, but it was um, it was maybe too predictable, I think. And Lambda doesn't exactly tell you how it auto scales, but probably it was simple enough for Lambda to gracefully auto scale very nicely, whereas our real production traffic was not predictable enough for Lambda to, to um, scale gracefully. So I think that's one where I wish we had um, maybe done more realistic load testing uh, to understand, yeah. to be able to do that comparison better, to be able to make a better decision ahead of time. But 
I look back at it, that's one of those ones where I don't know, it could have gone either way. You know, I, I think it, yeah. it could have been, maybe that was, maybe if we had done both, maybe that was the better decision. Uh, it wasn't too bad. It just had some surprises. You know, I thought we had assessed cold start problems sufficiently and, and we hadn't looked into it as much as, as much as maybe we could have. Yeah. You had a vacation to get to, man. No <laughs> problem there. Well, I, I think as <laughs> as you do, you schedule a break and then, you know, something delays something else. And then, you know, something, some window that you thought you were going to be around for it does, And you're like, I don't know, sometimes with scheduling, you're just like, you can't win with scheduling sometimes, man. Yeah. Well, dude, Keith, thank you so much for coming on here. I think this is a perfect place to end it. I would love to chat with you for more and more hours. Uh, but as you know, I got to go run and grab my daughter from school. So this has been fun, man. I appreciate you coming on here and chatting with yes, me. Yes, it's been great. And thanks for having me. And let's chat again more in the future.